I'm Pat Doris. Welcome to the story on this Monday. Things are really heating up here in Oregon in politics. The respected Cook Report has moved Oregon's new 6th Congressional District from a rating of leans Democrat to now toss-up. That comes as we examine attack ads aimed at both candidates, which makes this our big story. Tonight we're going to fact check an ad aimed at Mike Erickson. Why check his first? Well, because we're going in alphabetical order and E for Erickson comes before S for Salinas. We will look at an ad against her tomorrow night. I hope you're finding these efforts helpful, by the way. I know you have a lot of questions about these ads. They're bombarding your screens. Recently, Julie rolled in to ask, can you please do some fact checking on the political ad touting Mike Erickson as a drug user and someone who insisted on a woman getting an abortion? It seems extreme to me. It also seems like those things may have happened a couple decades ago. People change. I'm curious and interested. Thanks for your question, Julia. We are going to dig into the first part of your question for sure. Here's the ad. It does not say that Erickson is a drug user, but it does accuse him of being charged with drug possession, and it looks like someone is getting ready to do a whole bunch of cocaine there. The ad made Erickson so angry he sued his opponent, Andrea Salinas, and her campaign for $800,000. He said that's what it's cost him to run his own ads countering the false allegation. Let's take a look at this line by line. The truth about Mike Erickson and law enforcement? Erickson was charged with felony drug possession for illegal oxycodone. The ad cites an Oregon State Police report from 2016. OSP sent me a brief version of that. The incident happened on September 17th of 2016. In the report, the trooper says he pulled over a vehicle in Hood River after he watched the driver stumble to his truck and get into the driver's seat, then fail to stay within his lane as he was driving. The driver was Mike Erickson. According to the report, Erickson blew a .12 on the breathalyzer, which is above the legal limit for alcohol, which is .08. While he was being booked into jail, a search turned up a single 5 milligram oxycodone pill, which Erickson said belonged to his wife. I highlighted the part where the report states Erickson was lodged on the DUI and the unlawful possession of oxycodone. And you can see down below there's a charge that says possession oxycodone. So you might be thinking, well, okay, then the report's accurate, right? Well, not so fast. Julia Shumway from the Oregon Capital Chronicle has dug into all this, and it's not as cut and dried as you might think. In her reporting, Shumway talked with Erickson's defense attorney, who said she had made a mistake in court documents that incorrectly indicated Erickson would avoid felony drug charges by pleading guilty to the DUI. Shumway found the document in question and reports that it states, DAA has agreed to dismiss felony possession of controlled substance upon tender of guilty plea. The lawyer told the Chronicle that felony charges were never on the table and that she erred when writing the document. And there's more. The Hood River District Attorney, who was elected long after all this happened, told Shumway the only thing that is a public record is that he was never, ever charged. He was never cited by the police officer with a criminal citation for a felony. And she continued, the only thing that was ever filed was that he was ever faced was the misdemeanor driving under the influence charge. Anything else? is a mistake. Okay, so now maybe you're thinking, oh, even though the trooper who wrote that report after the arrest put possession of oxycodone down under the heading of a charge, maybe it really wasn't a charge. But then Shumway delivers up this. She said that when Erickson was contacted before her first story about all this, he did not dispute the existence of drug charges. He said he was cited for carrying one oxycodone pill, which he said he was carrying for his wife. The reporter quotes Erickson as saying, the judge dropped the charges for possessing one oxycodone pill after we demonstrated it was my wife's prescription. He added in a statement provided by his campaign to the reporter, I did the diversion classes required and the DUI was dismissed. I made a mistake. So what about this though? If the candidate was telling the reporter that the judge dropped the charge, how can he and his defense attorney and the district attorney in Hood River now be insisting there never was a charge to drop? Does this all revolve around the definition of the word charge? Is it not a charge when police arrest you for something? Is it only a charge when the district attorney files that in court? Let's go for the low hanging fruit first. Under Oregon law, possession of a single pill of oxycodone is a misdemeanor. So is it accurate to say Erickson was charged with felony drug possession? No, he was not. That is false. Was he found with a pill that he did not have a prescription for? Yes, he was. 
Was that powder you see in the ad a wild exaggeration? Oh yes, it is. Late last week, Mike Erickson did an interview with Laurel Porter for our Straight Talk show, which, by the way, you can find right now on our KGW YouTube page. And being the terrific interviewer that she is, Laurel asked him about the DUI and eventually about the ad. We'll show you his answers, but I want you to really watch this first one because it's quite the pivot. And a reminder here, a pivot is when a reporter asks someone a question they don't like, and so instead of answering the question asked, they answer a question that they like better. Okay, watch this. You've positioned yourself as the law and order candidate who's tough on crime, yet you're having to discuss the DUI you got in 2016 for drunk driving at Hood River. How do you reconcile your tough talk on crime and your choice to drink and drive then and your plea deal in that case? Well, first of all, let me say crime is out of control in the state. Uh, it's rampant everywhere. I'm just sick and tired of the politicians and the, the DAs and the people out here just going through and letting a slap on a hand for someone to go through and robs a store breaks into a car, whatever it is. So we need to do everything we can to uphold the laws and enforce the laws in the state. I don't think we're doing a good enough job here. Yeah, so there he goes on his talking points, and I think he would have gone on for a while, but Laurel came back to remind him of the question that she had asked. I think we need to see a stronger message. But Mike, how do you reconcile that, that position with your own choice to drink and drive? I've made one mistake in my life. If you look at my record, in my entire life, I've made one mistake. And I... I, I I thought it was fine. I was leaving a wedding and I, I had a, a couple of drinks too many. I thought it was fine. So I made a mistake in my life. I did the classes, did the diversion, and I, I regret doing that. So that's the one thing I've done wrong in my life that I wish I wouldn't have, and I'm sorry about that. And uh, now you're, you're suing. Again. You're, you're suing the Salinas campaign and Salinas herself for $800,000 <laughs> over a negative ad about that drunk driving incident. You know, there are a lot of negative ads running um, in all the campaigns, it seems. Why file a lawsuit over this one? Well, it's not about the, the, the DUI. It's about what she's saying. As many viewers have seen on your TV show and other channels here, Andrew Salinas has made false accusation after false accusation in the personal false untrue statements. The Oregonian did a review of this. They called the district attorney's office. They checked the facts. The Oregonian put in their paper here just last week that what Andrew Salinas is saying is 100% not true. She's impactful, not factual at all, not factual. The district attorney's office actually called her office and said, Salinas, and talk to her. What you're saying is not true. You should pull down those ads. The district attorney's office and the Oregonian both validated that what she's saying on TV is not true. What she's doing is she's up putting out negative, false lies on TV to get elected. If that's the kind of congresswoman you want, someone who'll lie to get elected, what would she do back in DC? Well, Laurel also had Erickson's opponent on Straight Talk and asked Andrea Salinas about that ad. Let me just say about the drug, your ad said he was charged with drug possession and prosecutors didn't actually charge him. He said in the first segment that the district attorney called you to tell you that was wrong. Uh, did your campaign make a mistake? I mean, do you have any regrets running that ad? No, I have no regrets. Um, there were three different documents, the incident report, the release report, and the plea petition that all cited possession of drugs as the charge and it says charge on there we actually flash up the incident report in the ad so i stand by what we said and how we you know how police he was not charged by the da but he was charged by state police little issue with our connectivity there but i wanted to leave that in so you could see her full answer so there's certainly a lot packed into those 15 seconds of the ad and we'd love to hear your thoughts on the candidates for the 6th District. Are you considering jumping the aisle and supporting either Salinas or Erickson? Has anything they've said or done on the campaign trail changed your mind? Let us know. You can email us at thestory at kgw.com or call and leave a voicemail. Our number is 503-226-5090. let us stick with politics for a minute here because Portland hosted the leader of the free world over the weekend as President Biden came to town. And before Air Force One touched down at Portland International during our show on Friday night, I might add, we asked for your take on a presidential visit to Portland, his second so far this year, and you did not disappoint. One person who did not tell us their name said, you asked what I thought of the president's visit to Oregon. Well, I don't feel like a president from either party should come to Oregon. It's a very large inconvenient. It's really just a dog and pony show. 
Well, there certainly are inconveniences that come with a presidential visit, including traffic impacts like this. The president's motorcade shut down I-205 South as he left the airport and came into town. Saturday, I was riding my bike along the waterfront and saw lots of you stopped in traffic along the Markham Bridge as the president moved around about 11 a.m. And let's not forget about the road closures and fencing around the events he attended, and especially downtown at the Dunaway Hotel, where he stayed the night. Let's highlight another viewer email. Anthony has a different approach. I am an Oregon Republican and don't always agree with the president. However, it is always an exciting time for our great state. So definitely some positivity there. And we want to end with a comment from a viewer named Maggie on the importance of one of our greatest freedoms, the vote. Yes, it is always noteworthy and appreciated when any president visits Oregon, she wrote. But when the purpose of such a high level visit is mainly to encourage voter turnout, I feel disgusted that it takes this much effort to dispel voter apathy and pervasive ignorance of how important and powerful this gift of the vote is as the outcome of each election affects our lives directly. So true. Your vote is a powerful tool. And if you don't like the way things are going in your community politically, you have two options to try and fix it. You can use your vote for someone that you think can fix the issue or jump into the political sphere yourself and get the job done. Politics is a messy world and it takes a special breed to want to be part of that. But you can always vote and make your voice heard. And speaking of your vote, if you're not registered to vote in Oregon or if you need to update your registration, time is running out. You need to register by the end of the day tomorrow if you want to cast a vote in the upcoming midterms in Oregon. And for you Washington voters, check this out. You're allowed to register in person anytime up until 8 p.m. on election day. But if you are registering online or by mail, your deadline is earlier. It's Halloween, October 31st. If you're not sure of how to do any of that, hey, we're here to help. Just text the word vote to the number on your screen. The number is 503-226-5088. Again, that's vote to 503-226-5088. And don't forget about KGW's gubernatorial debate this week. It's Wednesday at seven o'clock, sponsored by KGW and the Oregonian. We'll have Christine Drazen, Tina Kotek, and Betsy Johnson live right here in our studio to answer your questions. It's the last debate before the election. Ballots will be mailed out later this week. If you've not made up your mind on who to vote for, be sure to tune in. Coming up on The Story, Mayor Ted Wheeler wants to ban unsanctioned camping in Portland and build massive homeless campuses instead. We've heard this all before, but we took the details to the three candidates for governor to see if they think it's a step in the right direction or another idea doomed to fail. How they responded and what you need to know about the Wheeler plan when The Story returns.
Now to the latest on the homeless crisis. Mayor Ted Wheeler is expected to announce a plan this week to ban unsanctioned camping and build massive homeless campuses instead. Is this the plan we've been waiting for or is it yet another pipe dream? Time will tell. But each candidate for governor has been briefed on the plan. Blair Best brings us their thoughts. Mayor Ted Wheeler calls the crisis on Portland streets a vortex of misery. He's now calling on the county for help in banning unsanctioned homeless camping over the next 18 months. Now, there's still a lot of questions on what this ban will actually look like or how it will be enforced, and we're still waiting to hear from the mayor on that. Meanwhile, we caught up with each candidate for governor to see what they think of the plan. Our housing and homelessness crisis is not new. Oregon's homeless crisis was the focus in Salem today, as Eugene and Beaverton mayors talked of what it will take to tackle it. And like many Oregonians, I'm frustrated because things are not working the way they should be. Joining them, Democratic candidate for governor Tina Kotek. Because we all know we have a crisis on our streets and on our sidewalks. Not in attendance today was Portland Mayor Ted Wheeler, who is expected to release a plan this week on banning unsanctioned homeless camping and building three 500-person homeless campuses instead. In a letter to the Multnomah County Commissioner, he asks for help responding to this crisis. He says there are 700 homeless camps across the city, making it nearly impossible for city outreach crews to keep up. And some wait lists for affordable housing are up to nine years long, not to mention the drug use that's just compounding the problem. It takes every level of government working together to solve an issue like homelessness. Mayor Wheeler lays out a list of requests, among them asking the county to open all 2,400 homeless shelter spaces. The latest data from the Joint Office dashboard suggests there were about 1,400 open in August. Manage Safe Rest Villages, pay for and operate three designated camping sites, along with increasing response to the drug epidemic. Meanwhile, he says the city will build 20,000 affordable housing units by 2023, enforce camping bans, and keep the streets clean. All three candidates for governor were briefed on the plan last week. They say it's a solution that's long overdue. I think it's a good idea. They need to be able to make it happen. We're finally getting to where we should have been a long time ago, and I'd like to believe that it has been my presence in this election cycle that has perhaps helped motivate the mayor. Republican candidate Christine Drazen couldn't talk to us on camera, but told KGW in a statement, quote, I'm encouraged to see the city taking action. I look forward to working with Mayor Wheeler and local leaders as our state's next governor to ensure homelessness is rare and temporary, reopen our sidewalks and public spaces, restore safety to our streets, and support Oregonians in need. What's the level of services that are going to be provided? Are we going to have places just for women? or for families, so trying to understand how they're going to, you know, protect and help people feel secure. He's got a long ways to go before it can be implemented, starting with trying to harmonize the county and the city's approach to this problem. We sat down with each candidate for governor to hear their plans on tackling the homeless crisis. You can watch that segment on KGW Plus. In Salem, Blair Best, KGW News. Now, every time we do a story about homelessness and possible solutions to the camping issue, we hear from you. You tell us it matters to you. So we wanted to do something you don't normally see in a traditional broadcast. We wanted to have Blair answer a few additional questions about her report while she's still out in the field. We have three questions tonight. Did any of the candidates' responses surprise you? What are other reactions have you heard about the Wheeler proposal? And the plan calls for an 18-month process. Are there any steps that could happen in the short term? Here's Blair. Hey, Pat, joining you from downtown Salem. You asked if I was surprised by any of the candidates' response. And I would say the only response that did stand out to me was Betsy Johnson essentially taking credit for this proposed ban on homeless camping. She essentially said that it was her cries for a solution that is the reason that Mayor Ted Wheeler came out with this proposed ban on unsanctioned camping. And I think we all know that all three candidates have been saying this is a crisis and it needs a solution. And they've been saying that for quite a while now. So she's definitely not the only one. Uh, you asked what other reaction have you heard about Wheeler's proposed plan and it's still pretty fresh and new, but just going off of his previous bans, whether it's along high crash corridors or routes to school, people are skeptical, right? These, these plans look great on paper and they sound promising, yet in reality, they're pretty tough to implement. So there's still a lot of unanswered questions and I'm eager to hear what it will look like, how it will be enforced. 
So I think there's just a lot of unknown at this point and people have a right to be skeptical. You also asked, it's a, it's a long-term thing, right? It's a phased approach over 18 months. And you asked if there's anything that I think could be done in the short term. Well, really your guess is as good as mine. And I, I have to agree that I, with Mayor Wheeler, that I think this will take a long time. It could even take longer than 18 months, given the fact that he says there are 700 individual homeless camps across the city. That is going to take, that's gonna be a huge undertaking to go to each camp get the campers on board, tell them about these homeless campuses. I mean, what will that process look like? It, I feel it might even take longer than 18 months, but I'm eager to talk with Mayor Wheeler and hear what he has to say about this plan, how he's gonna enforce it. So yeah, a lot of unanswered questions, but we'll see how it goes. All right, great insights, Blair, thank you. Still to come on the story. It was a busy weekend around our area from a presidential visit to political debates to a late season wildfire exploding in size and prompting evacuations. We'll show you what you missed after the break. Here's a look at what you missed this weekend. On Saturday, President Biden campaigned with Democratic candidate for governor Tina Kotek and also made a stop at the East Portland Community Center. To a crowd of about 400 people, he talked about lowering the cost of prescription drugs through his Inflation Reduction Act. This year alone, drug companies rated the price of more than 1,200 drugs higher than the rate of inflation. He talked of his Inflation Reduction Act, which will go into effect in January. It will lower health care premiums for millions of Americans, drop prescription drug prices, and cap out-of-pocket expenses for prescription drugs at $2,000 per year. Today marks the beginning of Medicaid's open, they call it an open enrollment period. So when seniors pick plans for next year, they'll be able to take advantage of the progress we've made. Later in the day Saturday, the candidates for Southwest Washington's 3rd Congressional District faced off in a debate. Republican Joe Kent and Democrat Marie Glusenkamp Perez took questions from newspaper journalists, and it started with a question about why each would be the best person to represent the 3rd District. I'm running for Congress to be an independent voice for Southwest Washington. I will go to Washington, D.C. to be a check on Nancy Pelosi, Joe Biden, and one-party rule. As they debated in Vancouver on Saturday, both Democrat Marie Glusenkamp Perez and Republican Joe Kent had strong responses to a question about immigration. 
I want to ban economic immigration. If a visa takes a job away from an American citizen, we must prioritize Americans. My opponent will say that I'm racist for saying so, but I want to put American workers first because I think it's our obligation to provide good paying jobs for our people. That Joe Kent's plan to ban all legal immigration for 20 years is economic sabotage. Sunday, the Nakia Creek fire burning for a week near Larch Mountain in Clark County broke through containment lines, prompting thousands of evacuations. But the fire more than doubled in size Sunday, fueled by dry, windy conditions. It's burning about nine miles north of Camas, where Stephanie Warren owns a farm. She's been keeping an eye on the fire, ready to move her family and animals. We had been saying a few days ago, as long as the winds don't pick up, we should be okay. But Mother Nature had other plans, and the winds did pick up. That pushed the fire to break containment lines Sunday, forcing new evacuation orders. If you missed any of our big stories from last week, we have a newsletter. It comes out every Monday, and it carries a rundown of our biggest stories. It's easy to subscribe. Just open the camera on your phone, point it at this QR code on your screen, and it'll take you to a page where you can sign up. You can also go to kgw.com slash newsletter. Alrighty, keep sending your questions and comments to the story at kgw.com. When we come back, how your company or organization can help make the holidays special for local kids. For our Hey Help profile this week, we're talking about the KGW Great Toy Drive, which is coming soon. We want to help everyone have a more happy holiday season this year. You can join now. Just go to kgw.com slash toy. That's the end of our show. Thanks for watching and being with us. And remember the story, our story? Well, that never ends. I'll see you tomorrow.